<laughs> so we shall begin with now the petroleum geology and in this process let us first start with the understanding of the formation of kerogen kerogen we can say in loose terms is the raw material for generation of petroleum so going by the word petroleum what does it mean Pet petroleum is derived from two words petra which means rock and oleum which means oil so basically the word petroleum it consists of oil as well as gas and you all are aware that these are two chemically and physically diverse group of compounds so they together can be termed as hydrocarbons now these hydrocarbons they range from or they grade from gases to liquids and uh, plastic or even solids so we can have these types of hydrocarbons now the gases they are of two types the hydrocarbons which are in gaseous form they are of two types one is the dry gas which is methane and the second one you can all guess it is the wet gas and these are ethane propane butane etc the liquid hydrocarbon it is oil oil crude oil like that the plastic hydrocarbon it includes a very famous substance known as asphalt while the solid hydrocarbon it is coal so these are the different types of uh, uh, you know hydrocarbons which exist in different states of matter now for the formation of the petroleum it is derived from a solid organic matter which is termed as kerogen okay so let us have a look at what is kerogen how it is formed because that is the initial point of generation of uh, petroleum we shall after understanding the formation of uh, kerogen then we shall look at the properties of petroleum and then we will go into the geological aspects of uh, studying petroleum geology so kerogen it is a solid organic matter solid organic matter which is insoluble in organic solvents solvents this kerogen once it is in the source rock we shall see later what a source rock is it generates petroleum now this uh, kerogen it is partly formed from 
the accumulation of uh, uh, macromolecular substances of biological origin which are resistant to degradation okay so kerogen it is partly formed from you know deposition or accumulation accumulation of macromolecular substances of biological origin that is why we call it this derived from organic matter so apart from accumulation of macro molecular substances of biological origin now what are these substances which are macromolecular and of biological origin and they are not easy to degrade they consist of cellular lipids algal cell walls cell membranes cuticles spores pollens so these are some of the uh, macromolecular substances which partly give rise to the kerogen so the kerogen it is uh, it has three major phases in the evolution of organic matter in response to burial so what happens is that once the uh, organic matter gets buried if this is the organic matter and this organic matter gets buried in a basin or in a depression so this organic matter has to undergo three processes which will lead to the evolution of this organic matter and cause the formation of kerogen the first one is diagenesis the second one it is termed as catagenesis and the third one this process is known as metagenesis so let us have a look at them one by one now diagenesis which is the first process in the evolution of organic matter so first of all it it occurs at shallow subsurface okay so the depth is not much occurs at shallow sub surface so in the process of uh, uh, diagenesis the temperatures and pressure they are near normal not very high because they are very close to the surface of the earth so once the uh, organic matter undergoes diagenesis then what happens here methane carbon dioxide and water they are expelled they are expelled so at this depth these uh, this expulsion is mainly caused by the biogenic activity the biogenic decomposition so uh, methane carbon dioxide and water they are expelled and they leave behind kerogen so what is the uh, net result of diagenesis the net result of diagenesis of organic matter is reduction of its oxygen content okay this is very important that diagenesis causes 
reduction of the oxygen content oxygen content so what uh, increases or what uh, uh, does not change the hydrogen to carbon ratio it remains unaltered remains unaltered so this is diagenesis of organic matter occurring at shallower depth at near normal temperature and pressure which leaves behind kerogen after expulsion of methane co2 and h2o and diagenesis causes reduction in the oxygen content and does not alter the hydrogen to carbon ratio next process is catagenesis so catagenesis what happens here it occurs at deeper depth than diagenesis so occurs in deeper subsurface deeper subsurface so now if this is the basin and this is the organic matter in the stage 1 let us say it was here at this depth now due to the tectonics and the overburden this depth of burial increases so burial continues and the same organic matter has now gone to a deeper subsurface depth so it starts now the uh, catagenesis and then there is an increase in temperature and pressure now it is this process of catagenesis where the petroleum is released from kerogen okay so petroleum is released from kerogen and in what order first oil is released and then gas is released so after the uh, kerogen now gives rise to petroleum then now what happens over here the hydrogen to carbon ratio it declines so in catagenesis the hydrogen to carbon ratio declines and uh, uh, oxygen to carbon ratio remains unaltered though it was less so it remains like that is no much change and the third process which is metagenesis now metagenesis occurs at very high temperature and pressure so much so that now it is very close to very close to temperature of metamorphism almost 200 degree celsius and more here the last hydrocarbon is generated last hydrocarbon and what is that it is methane again but remember the methane which you are seeing over here in diagenesis this methane is biogenic in origin so we call this methane as biogenic methane while the methane which you are seeing in metagenesis it is thermogenic methane thermogenic methane now here there is further decline in hydrogen to carbon ratio and then only carbon is left behind in the form of graphite graphite okay so this is how uh, the three process they operate the diagenesis catagenesis and metagenesis okay so the petroleum is expelled from kerogen in the catagenesis process all right 
Now let us have a look at the shallow diagenesis of organic matter. The shallow diagenesis of organic matter. Now what happens over here? Normally once uh, we look at the stratified water body. So in the stratified water bodies, an oxygenated zone overlies a reducing zone. So the interface between the two zones may lie within the water at the sediment water interface or if sediments are permeable below the sea bottom. So if we look at the stratified water bodies wherein the different layers of water are there, then these layers, uh, this stratification may be due to the density of the uh, various types of water. So the uh, less dense water shall be floating above the, the water of the higher density. So what happens over here is that as we uh, go deeper in this water, stratified water column, what do we get? We get that the, uh, you know, if oxygenated zone means the water layer which has a uh, higher uh, oxygen content, it overlies the reducing zone, means lower oxygen layer. Now what happens is that in the lower reducing zone, in the no reducing zone will always be poor in oxygen content remember this so what happens over here in the lower reducing zone now here since the oxygen is less so the biological activity won't be that proliferated so in the reducing zone anaerobic bacteria get active So what happens in the reducing zone, anaerobic sulfate reducing bacteria, they remove oxygen from sulfate ions releasing free sulfur. So you should remember name of uh, the uh, anaerobic bacteria which uh, reduces sulfate. So this anaerobic bacteria which is sulfate reducing bacteria. This sulfate reducing bacteria, a very common example is desulfovibrio. Desulfovibrio. This sulfate reducing desulfovibrio uh, uh, bacteria, it removes, it removes oxygen from oxygen from sulfate ions. So what happens over here, this sulfate ions, they uh, lose their oxygen to, uh, to form sulfur, okay. So this is in the zone, in the reducing zone. While in the oxygenated zone or the oxidizing zone, there is another bacteria, which is the uh, thiobacillus thiobacillus this thiobacillus bacteria what it does it again oxidizes uh, the sulfur to sulfate so let us have a look at this reaction I'm not putting the minus sign over here <clears throat> Okay, this is a reversible reaction based on the conditions of uh, oxidation and reduction. So, if D sulfovibrio acts on this uh, sulfate, it breaks it down to sulfur and oxygen. While if thiobacillus acts on it, it will again oxidize it to sulfate. So the 
uh, this reaction over here this direction from sulfate to sulfur and oxygen it is happening in the reducing zone that is anaerobic bacteria while the reverse is in the oxidizing zone that is aerobic bacteria thiobacillus so what happens over here in the reducing zone this free sulfur it may combine with iron in ferrous hydroxide to form pyrite so this free sulfur okay <clears throat> this free sulfur in the reducing zone in the reducing zone this free sulfur may react with iron to give pyrite so this is pyrite now the sulfate ions they may also react with organic matter to form hydrogen sulfide okay now this is a general formula ch2o so this is the organic matter this may give rise to bicarbonate and hydrogen sulfide so all these reactions they are going on and we'll see why these reactions are important so the first stage of biological decay first stage of biological decay what happens over here here this first stage is the reaction is an oxidation reaction okay so what happens over here this first stage of biological decay it generates water carbon dioxide then it also generates nitrates phosphates now uh, a very long uh, reaction i am writing this reaction but then i don't think you will be able to remember it uh, even i cannot remember it without having a note sheet with me a chit with me but yes keep it in mind that this is how these things uh, are generated from long chain organic compounds so ch2 o 106 316 H3 PO4. So when this reacts with oxygen, so what happens over here? It gives out. See, I'm writing a balanced reaction so that you need not bother about balancing it. Gives rise to carbon dioxide. Then we get the nitrates. And then we get this phosphate and then we get water so this is the first stage of react uh, of the biological decay wherein oxidation releases water co2 nitrate and phosphate from long chain organic compounds the second stage of decay the second stage it includes reduction of nitrates and nitrites so what happens over here ch2o 106 NH316 H3PO4 plus 
four of n h o three giving rise to one zero six c o two plus fifty five n two plus one seventy seven H two O plus H three PO four. So you saw here that the nitrates have been reduced to nitrites. Now <clears throat> this reaction of reduction of nitrates to nitrites it is followed in turn by sulfate reduction, which gives rise to H two S and ammonia. All these uh, reactions you should know what happens but you need not remember each and every reaction so this reduction of nitrites and nitrates it is followed by sulfate reduction so what happens over there ch2o 106 NH3, 6H3PO4 plus 52SO42 minus. They give rise to 106HCO3 minus plus 53H2S plus 16NH3. Plus H three PO four. So you saw here that this uh, sulfate has been reduced to H two S hydrogen sulfide. Now the organic compounds which uh, uh, make up the kerogen they are very diverse and complex, and they consist essentially of uh, items like protein, carbohydrates lipids lignin etc so out of these organic compounds the proteins are the least stable means they they degrade very quickly the proteins they are least stable while the lignins they are the most stable so what happens over here now these polymers they uh, are degraded to produce monomers so these are long chain compounds they are degraded to uh, produce the smaller chain or simple compounds by the digestion by enzyme so remember that the degradation of long chain organic compounds is nothing but a type of digestion by the microbes they release enzymes and this enzyme breaks them into the uh, bio monomers so for example carbohydrate and starch they get broken down to sugar cellulose gets converted to methane and carbon dioxide okay so these long chain uh, <clears throat> organic compounds they are broken down to the uh, smaller uh, compounds now of the bacterial decay of the bacterial decay a major byproduct is methane is methane so it's a commonly found byproduct of the bacterial decay so in environment where the deposition of organic matter and uh, you know its uh, decay and decomposition are very fast then free methane may come out to the surface so you must be aware that in some places which are marshy or swampy areas you will always get a pungent smell that is smell is of methane and therefore methane is also referred to as marsh gas so this marsh gas it seeps out seeps out uh, on the surface 
from subsurface it comes to the surface and under what condition where the deposition of organic matter and rate of decay are very fast so where does this seep out <clears throat> so faster deposition of organic matter and faster rate of decay okay now uh, this is about the uh, organic matter rate of decomposition now then proteins what are proteins made up of proteins are made up of amino acid and peptides so when protein will degrade or it will decompose it will give rise to amino acid and peptides similarly lipid and waxes they degrade into glycerol fats they degrade into fatty acids so all these long chain compounds uh, they degrade to smaller compounds okay a small chain so how does this happen so with increase in the overburden pressure so as the as the overburden pressure it increases so what happens over here it causes compaction compaction now within the top 300 meter of the burial the porosity of clay typically reduces from 80% to 40% uh, or 30% okay so this compaction what it causes compaction reduces porosity of clay from 80% to 30% and where is this happening this is happening within top 300 meters of the burial also there is loss of water okay so this once this water it uh, it escapes it contains in solution carbon dioxide methane hydrogen sulfide and other uh, compounds of decay so this water is not pure water rather it is a solution of carbon dioxide methane hydrogen sulfide and then other organic compounds which are now smaller in size so at this time at this time once the overburden pressure increases and compaction occurs several inorganic reactions take place which lead to the formation of early orthogenic minerals now as this uh, depth of burial increases the ambient pressure increases role of bacteria declines and these inorganic reactions they accelerate so remember as the rate of burial increases or the depth of burial increases due to the increase in the overburden pressure the bacterial or biological activity stops or reduces here due to the <clears throat> compaction and the loss of the water which includes co2 methane h2s and other organic compound as decay products the formation of early orthogenic minerals starts okay all right so once all these things happen and imagine that in the sediments which are now getting compacted there is large amount of organic matter and this organic matter now gets compacted under the overburden pressure and increasing temperature so it now uh, uh, gives rise to kerogen so kerogen is disseminated organic matter in sediments which consists of carbon hydrogen and oxygen with minor amounts of nitrogen and sulfur so kerogen it is disseminated scattered in the uh, in these sediments disseminated organic matter in sediments 
and as i have already told you that kerogen is insoluble in organic solvent it consists of carbon hydrogen oxygen these are the major uh, components while minor comp so this is the major constituents while nitrogen and sulfur they are present in minor amounts so the uh, kerogen has been classified into three types on the basis of chemical properties okay three types on the basis of chemical properties first one is the kerogen of algal origin second one is kerogen of leptinitic origin okay and the third one is kerogen of humic origin so let us see what these are the kerogen type 1 kerogen type 1 is algal in origin it is high in hydrogen content relative to oxygen content so here the h is to c ratio is more than o is to c ratio okay so h is to c ratio over here is 1.65 while oxygen to carbon ratio is hardly 0.06 in kerogen type 1 the lipids are dominant compounds they are dominant compounds you know these are derivatives of oil fat and waxes but most importantly which you need to remember is that kerogen type 1 it gives rise to oil so it is kerogen or k1 it is oil prone it is oil prone so if uh, you are asked about which type of kerogen is more likely to give uh, oil then it is the kerogen type 1 so it is a very complex structure but if you can draw it in your uh, gsi exam answer then you will be fetching more marks with it okay so let me draw for you i don't know how many of you may be able to keep it in mind but yes of course it is not required actually that uh, you uh, should remember this diagram by heart this is the work of people who are good in chemistry okay so this is how the kerogen type 1 looks in its chemical structure okay now the kerogen type 2 or k2 it is also sometimes referred to as intermediate and uh it is leptinitic in origin leptinitic origin the kerogen type 2 it is rich in aliphatic compounds
these are the properties which you should remember it has still higher h is to c ratio than o is to c where h is to c ratio is 1.28 while this is now 0 0.1 so here now the o is to c ratio has slightly improved and it is more than the kerogen type 1 the original organic matter for this type of kerogen it consists of algal detritus okay so the original organic matter it consists of algal detritus along with the materials derived from phytoplanktons and zooplanktons okay and this type of kerogen it may give rise to both oil as well as gas i am not going to bother you now with the diagram of the kerogen chemical structure the third type it is the humic origin kerogen now the humic origin kerogen it is low in aliphatic compounds while it is rich in aromatic compounds i am sure you must have read about the aliphatic and aromatic compounds in your lower classes now the kerogen type 3 it is normally produced from lignin of higher woody plants lignin of higher woody plants mainly the trees plants these are coal prone sometimes may produce little gas as well here the h is to c ratio is substantially lower h is to c ratio is less than 0 0.84 while the o is to c ratio it is approximately 0 0.13 okay now all these three types of kerogen they need to undergo maturation so let me give you a very common example let us suppose that somebody wants to cook chicken biryani for that the person needs raw material first which include chicken which include rice and spices so after that you put them together in a container in a pressure cooker and you expose it to some flame remember that the the temperature generated by that heat or that flame needs to be optimum and for perfect amount of time so if you put that cooker on the gas flame and then after five minutes you pick it up and say that now it is cooked if you'll open the container you will see that the that the uh, chicken biryani has not been cooked it remains raw if you put it on uh, the flame for substantial amount of time and uh, uh, at appropriate heat then once you lift it after let us say an hour or so then you will find you have kept the flame low then you will find that that the chicken biryani has been cooked properly but if you leave that on uh, leave that container on that flame for longer time the biryani might get burnt similarly so we we call the uncooked biryani as immature immature the properly cooked biryani as mature and the burnt uh, biryani which was kept on the flame for longer time as over mature similarly in case of hydrocarbons the raw material the organic matter or the kerogen whatever type kerogen it is type 1 type 2 or type 3 whatever type it first needs to be subjected to a proper depth, proper temperature. After that, the amount of time under which it is uh, exposed to that temperature is very important. So, the maturation, the maturation of the 
Kerogen is a very very important process which depends on the thermal gradient, the depth of burial as well as the temperature. So let us see what is the path uh, given a path taken by the uh, kerogen for its maturation. So the kerogen matures during catagenesis to give off oil and gas. So this you should remember that maturation it occurs during catagenesis. Okay, with increasing maturity. First, oil is expelled and then the gas is expelled, as I have already previously told. And this maturation, it depends on temperature and pressure. So, these are two very, very important uh, uh, factors on which it depends. So, now if we look at the maturation paths so this will look somewhat like this for the three types of kerogen if we plot on the y axis it is the hydrogen to carbon atomic ratio while on the x axis we plot the oxygen to carbon atomic ratio this way so it increases in this direction now let us put some values over here 0 0.1 0 0.5 1.0 1 1.5 and over here for the x-axis 0 0 0.1 0 0.2 now let us have a look at the three different types of kerogen and what path do they take okay So, this one, this is kerogen type 1, this is sapropelic kerogen which is algal in origin, okay, then this is type 2. This is, you know, lipid-rich kerogen, phyto and zooplanktons and this is type 3 which is the humic kerogen generated by the land plants. So, at the different atomic ratios, let us see where they will generate oil, where they will generate the gas. So, the oil gets generated over here. This yellow color path it is for the oil generation okay and then the gas generation field it is the second one over here while this one it, this is the field of graphite, pure carbon, which occurs at the uh, metagenesis. So, this, this one, 
this is the oil generation field while this green colored one is the gas generation field this diagram was given by van crevelin and therefore in his honor this is also known as van crevelin diagram you will find this diagram in every petroleum geology book van crevelin diagram now it is seen that the significant oil generation it occurs at a temperature between 60 to 120 degrees celsius so for oil generation the optimum temperature ranges from 60 degrees to 120 degrees celsius while for the gas generation the temperature typically ranges between 120 degrees to 250 degree celsius above this temperature above 250 degrees celsius the kerogen becomes inert because it has now expelled all the hydrocarbon so at temperatures higher than 250 degrees celsius the kerogen becomes inert why because it has now given out all its hydrocarbon all the oil and gas and what remains there is the graphite so this is how the van crevelin diagram is formed now if we look at the sorry i'll add more slides if we look at the uh, the diagram of the thermal gradient along with the depth so let us see how this uh, maturation of kerogen occurs okay so this is the depth in kilometers while here it is the thermal gradient and it is measured in degrees celsius per 100 meters okay so let us assume some depths 1 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 kilometers while the geothermal gradient 1 degree celsius per 100 meter 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 and 10 now if we need to uh, draw the uh, you know the path of the maturation then This is how it will look like. So here we are seeing that at shallower depths where the temperature is around 60, 65 degrees Celsius to 120 to 150 degrees Celsius, this is one zone beyond a uh, shallower to which shallower to which the kerogen remains immature immature kerogen from here to here this is the mature kerogen while beyond this it is the over mature kerogen now the temperature is quite high the time uh, to which it is exposed is quite high so this window between 65 to 150 degrees celsius approximately here the oil gets generated shallower to this zone we get 
the biogenic gas of which was the result of shallow diagenesis while here uh, deeper than this zone we get the thermogenic or thermal gas which was the result of the uh, metagenesis okay so this gives us the concept of oil window and then gas window uh, which may be drawn somewhat like this. I am just going to draw it for you. So, very simple diagram. It will always be asked if the question comes about the oil and gas window. They are dependent on the uh, temperature range. So, here it is the surface of the earth and then this is the depth. All right. Okay, now here the shallower depth where the temperatures are quite low, we get the biogenic methane. Then at around uh, 3 kilometer or so, we get the start of the oil window. Then as has been the convention, we get the gas window and then we get the graphite zone. Now where the hydrocarbons they have become inert. So this is the dry gas and then oil. First the heavy oil is expelled. After that, at more depth, the light oil gets expelled. This is the, the uh, concept of the uh, oil and gas window. And this is these are the temperature values in degrees Celsius. So we get over here, you know, 25 degrees Celsius, then uh, 50 degrees Celsius from 60. Sorry, 50 will be here. 50 degrees Celsius temperature, then the 60 to uh, around 120, we get the oil window over here. This is 120 degrees Celsius, and then beyond that, now up till 250 degrees Celsius, we get the gas window. So it is 120 to 100. 50 degrees Celsius. Different books give you uh, the different range. So, for oil window, the temperature ranges from 50, uh, 60 degrees, 60 degrees to 150 degrees approximately, degrees Celsius. While for the gas window, the temperature has to be 120 to 150 to 250 degree Celsius. This is the temperature range for the oil window and gas window respectively the uh, this is the concept about the generation and maturation of the uh, kerogene in the next class we shall be discussing the properties of petroleum which gets generated from the kerogene and then we shall start with the concept of the petroleum system till then keep on reading there are some very good books but I'll rather suggest for petroleum geology, you can read the book by R.C. Shelley, The Elements of Petroleum Geology. Or you can read the book by Leverson, The Petroleum Geology by Leverson. But R.C. Shelley is a bit easier to understand than the language of Leverson. So, we'll see you in the next class.